بِهَذَا مِنْهُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ أَمِينَ الْعَالَمِينَ أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وهو رمضان الذي أُجل فيه القرآن ويقول الله عز وجل في بداية سورة البقرة ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين وبشرح صدري ويسر لي امري واحذر عقبة من لساني يفقه قولي والله فتنتنا عند الموت لا اله الا الله سامي يا رب العالمين. ان شاء الله I'm only going to be speaking with you for about a half hour and I'll try and make it as interactive as I possibly can. Uh, the intent that I have of what I want to share with you is based really on some of the thoughts that you may have on the subject. I'd like for people to show of hands, and then I'll pick on you, to call out some names of Islamic subjects, Islamic sciences, something you study in Islam. Show of hands, please. Yeah? Economics? Okay, if this how yeah, that's certainly an area of Islamic studies. Other areas? Yeah? Sharia? Law? Yeah? Usul al fiqh Principles of Jurisprudence? What else? Yeah? Sira, which is a component of a larger subject, which is? Maqasat al-Sharia, purposes of Allah. Yeah? Aqeedah? Aqeedah, certainly. But Siyah, I didn't mention Siyah, but it's part of a bigger picture. What is that? Yeah? Moonside? Dot com? Huh? Hadith? Definitely. You're missing some big ones still, yeah. History. History. What else? Political science? Whatever comes under that would probably be under Sharia, if there is mention. Say that again? No, Islamic science. That's not Islamic science. It's an Arabic word. Tafsir, certainly. Tafsir. Um, so there's a lot to study. The reason I want to study Islam. Bottom line, you've got a lot to study. And, and it's not like you can pick up a book or read one document or uh, go through one curriculum and you basically know Islam. It's, it's a very big academic endeavor, right? And of course, within the Islamic scholarly tradition, you have people that specialize in each one of these areas. Though Islamic scholars tend to be all-rounders, they know enough about all of these areas, but then they go and specialize in one, right? When you and I approach the subject of Islamic studies as contemporaries, people that probably many of us started engaging in Islamic studies later in our lives, right? Um, almost when you reach adulthood, you know, late teenagers or college students or whatever, um, and you try to learn something about Islam, what are some of the resources at your disposal that you personally may have experience with? That you try to learn Islam, where did you get it from? Yeah. The Quran. Okay, what else? Yeah? So you found that come. Go on. I'm sorry? Why is okay in what? Okay. So the internet. Can you see how we Okay. Internet. What else? Books. Of course in what language? Arabic? Really? I'm impressed. For most of you, Arabic books? English. Let's let's be honest. Lectures, we'll take CDs, illegal MP3s, you name it. The ones that begin, please do not copy. Yeah, I got to No, I don't. Okay. So, we have our, primarily our resources are multimedia materials for most of us. Of course, attending conferences and, uh, you know, attending lectures, at least lectures that are meant to teach you something. Not like this one, I'm not teaching you anything. But lectures that are meant to teach you an Islamic subject or attending a class attending, taking a course, etc. Resources of this nature, however, are limited, correct? And so what we find uh, among Muslims is a huge diversity in terms of their understanding of Islam. And if you are part of any community, um, even at, at, at the micro level, at an MSA or at a masjid or whatever, you'll find people that have a very different take on the same subject. Drastically different. And their take, of course, is based on things that they know to be true, things that they've learned. 
And like I, what I try to illustrate to you is Islam is a very deep thing. It's a very complicated subject. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a profound study. And so to have a position that is concrete, 100%, this is the right way, for most people, it's not really based on actual knowledge of the subject. What is it based on? What is it based on? Experience? I, I think prayer should be done this way. What is that based on? Hearsay for many people. You know, it's scary, but it's true. For many people, it is hearsay. For others, what is it? Hmm? Opinion. Uh, maybe they heard from their imam over a local question. Maybe they read it on a website. Maybe they read that this hadith is sahih, etc., etc. And of course they trust it, so they take it. Now, there it is, before I go into the real subject uh, of the evening, what I want to share with you is one thing that we all have to be very, very clear on. Our deen is a deen of trust. Angel Jibreel entrusted the message to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entrusted this message with his companions. His companions gave that trust to the first generation and so on and so on and so on, correct? It is a deen of trust. In Western academic studies, especially history, the concept of trust is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. If a person says such and such happened, that can't be taken. Because there is no concept of trust. There's only scientific evidence and non-scientific evidence, right? And one of the biggest problems with that, that the, uh, the non-Muslims, especially Orientalists and stuff, have with Quran and Quran preservation, that it's been maintained in this way. Of course, there are other historical scientific evidence to it. But the issue of trust is that the heart of preservation of Quran, they don't really take it. They don't, they don't want to consider that issue. But we have always been a people of trust. Now, there are some among us who argue that I follow Quran and Sunnah because those are the true teachings of Islam and I don't trust anybody else. Right? You ever heard that before? Now I want you to understand something very clearly. Between Quran and Sunnah and your application of Quran and Sunnah, there is something in the middle. What is in the middle? Your intellect. You're processing the information and then you're applying it, correct? So basically when you say, I only follow Quran and Sunnah and I don't follow anyone else. What you are essentially saying is that you are the, uh, the most qualified authority you could find to, to interpret what the Quran is saying and what the Sunnah is saying, and you don't find anybody better qualified to do so. Okay? Which is a very tall claim. Now, I just want to walk you through a little bit of this as a tangent subject, but I think it's important because it's a growing concern among you. Disrespect for scholarship. You know the famous hadith? Alaykum bi sunnati. Be committed to my sunnah. You know the part of this hadith that is not often quoted? What does that mean? The legacy of the rightly guided caliphs. Were they prophets? No. Yet the Prophet himself وسلم, commanded us in that same hadith to commit to their legacy also. In addition to his own. Which means he trusts that when they make a decision, it will be based on how he trained them, correct? And you will find people today that will say, I am true to Allah and His Messenger, therefore I am qualified to make corrections in some fatwa that Ali may have given with Allah anhu, or Umar bin al-Khattab may have given with Allah anhu, because according to the Sunnah, this is better. According to the, the Sahih Hadith, contradicts what Umar bin al-Khattab did with Allah anhu, or contradicts what Uthman bin Allah anhu did. Now, as far as the textbook is concerned, that makes sense. Okay, there's the, here's the text, this is the hadith, and this is the action of the Sahabi, and apparently there's a contradiction. But there's a big difference here. You know what the difference is? We read a hadith, and those people, how did they read a hadith, or did they hear it from the mouth of the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We read about the historical context, and they lived the historical context. So if you were to compare who has a better understanding of the same text, among any of the scholars and a Sahabi, who will always be hands down. There is no comparison. There is no disagreement that the Sahaba's understanding of this being is the most pristine, most solid understanding. And just to solidify the subject before you, across Islamic scholarship, there's diversity in Islamic scholarship, across Islamic scholarship, 
If somebody wants to study the C, the principle, the, the science of interpreting Quran and understanding the implications of the ayat of Quran, you know what the bare minimum requirement is as far as inter which mufassir everybody has to know? Who's the mufassir that everybody has to know? Of course, the Rasul them when he made tafsir of an ayat after him. Which mufassir do you have to study if you're a student of tafsir? You know? There's one man. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu. Those are happy of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is ijma' of the ummah united. If you pick up any book of tafsir, you will find mention of what Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, said about this ayah, or that ayah, or that ayah, or that ayah. Why? Because he was entrusted with this knowledge and the guarantee of that is with, given by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Anyway, I just wanted to make mention of this point because we see an increasing uh, uh, level of, I would call it immaturity and intolerance. In terms of real knowledge of being, where people argue the hadith says this, and these people don't know mustalaq of hadith, they don't know the sunnah of hadith, they don't know the science of narration, they don't know the sunnah of fiqh, they haven't studied the differences of opinion and the evidences of all the scholars that disagree. Nothing, they've just read a website and they're saying the hadith says this, therefore you are doing kufr if you don't follow. It's a very immature position to have. It's not a very sound position to have. And you know, the last thing I'll mention is one of the fatawa of Bukhari, Rahmanullah. Everybody knows who Bukhari is? You know what he said? He said it is haram for anyone to comment on a hadith until, unless they themselves either took it from someone who had ijazah in hadith, who themselves has certified knowledge of hadith themselves, or they themselves have jazah. They can't comment on a hadith. What do we find today? You go online, Google, Bukhari, colon, prayer. Pick up a bunch of hadith, translate it into English, of course. You print them out and say, I know everything there is to know about prayer. It's a very dangerous thing to do. It's an extremely dangerous approach. The last thing I'll tell you about Quran, especially about Quran, and then I'll go to the real subject, I promise this time, is that the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith said, whoever interprets the Quran, from his own opinion, though correctly, is still sinful. Now listen to that again. If somebody interprets the Quran, and their interpretation is not invalid, it's not invalid, but the fact that they acted creatively in interpreting the text, they have actually also committed a sin. This is the degree of preservation of this deen that we enjoyed from, from the very beginning, and now we're seeing a serious decline in that, that, that understanding. So we have to try to be more sensitive, as, especially as youth, and I, I dare say impressionable youth, that can get caught up in a lot of propaganda. And just to, to, to give you a litmus test of the propaganda, which you have to be careful for, are people that are saying such and such and such scholar, or such and such and such person, they're going to hell, and they're deviated, and they're this and they're that. I mean, if your concern is learning Islam, you should be less concerned with sending people to hell than with learning Islam yourself, right? So we have to become much more careful about this issue. Uh, inshallah ta'ala in my brain. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about, the month of Ramadan is significance. Allah puts two terms, subhanahu wa ta'ala, together in this ayah that defines Ramadan. Shahr Ramadan and the Nihun Zilat in the Quran. The two key words in the ayah are Ramadan and Quran. Those are the two key terms. So basically, this is the month of Quran. This is the month in which our scholars, many of them, Rahmahumullah, you know, they used to be scholars of hadith and fiqh and tafsir, other things. They used to put all their books of hadith away and they say, this is the month of Quran, we're only going to study Quran and teach Quran and never ask Quran and make, draw, make some long salam of Quran this month. This is the month of Quran. They used to give it special dedication. The reason I want to bring that up is because in my observation, Allah only knows best as a people, especially as Muslim youth, we are very far from Islam anyway, but we're really, really far from the Quran. We have a huge gap between ourselves and Quran, for many reasons. But I want to try and encourage all of us to close that gap this coming month. To come closer to Allah Azawajal's book. And the, the, this, these are really vague words, you know, come closer to Allah's book. So I want to be a little more specific in what I'm requesting of myself and all of you, inshallah. You know, the, the term Huda, who can translate it? Guidance. Guidance. The Quran declares itself Huda, Huda the Nas, right? It's a guidance for mankind. Now the term guidance is kind of vague, and it can be taken in a whole number of, of ways. And I want to make it a little more specific with just simple examples, so you understand what the term Huda linguistically means. Huda literally means to show someone the way. When do you show someone the way? When they're lost. And of course, showing someone, someone the way implies that you're leading them to a destination, correct? 
So when Allah says Quran is guidance, in effect what he is saying is this Quran illustrates a path. And that path leads to a destination. Let's take another like common example. There's this person that needs to catch a flight in JFK. And they're stuck somewhere in Brooklyn. They don't know where to go. They pull over at a gas station, they ask for directions, the guy gives them directions, take a left here, take a left, take a right here, you'll get up on the Belt Parkway, Belt Parkway will turn to Manly, there you are at the airport. He gives them step by step, 10 steps for the directions. And the guy says, thank you very much. Is he listening to those directions carefully or not? The person who needs to catch a flight. Is he a yes or no? Yes. Totally. He's, he's desperate because he needs to catch his flight, correct? And this person, this gas station attendant, says, I'm pretty good at giving directions to the airport. So he makes a flyer of directions to the airport and passes them out to everyone who comes to get gas at the station. Do people want it? He's crazy. People don't want it. You don't give directions unless people ask for them or want them. Directions only help people that need them. Directions don't help anyone that don't need them. In effect, what I'm trying to imply is, if you and I, in our mentality, in our attitude, don't feel the need for directions, the Quran is not of help to us. Who then? A guidance. Guidance does not guide anyone that doesn't want it. If we don't want it, it will not benefit us. It will not benefit us whatsoever. You will get the reward for, you know, uh, reciting it. You don't want guidance from Quran, you just want, you know, ajr. So you're reciting Quran. You will, because the Prophet's command, the Prophet's uh, promise is that you will get reward for every letter. Right? And so you will, you will get that reward, but you will not get what you didn't ask for. You asked for reward, you got it. But you didn't ask for guidance, so you don't necessarily get guidance. And the Quran's primary function is what? Primary function. It's not a book of giving you rewards. What is it for? Guidance. So you can get secondary benefit out of Quran by memorizing it, by using it in prayer, by reciting it, you know, by even learning, studying it. But if you don't want to take its directions, and you don't understand it as such, it's something that gives me directions, then the one thing you will not get from it is what it came for. And that is guidance. And so we need to, all of us need to understand this function, this essential function of Quran, of being a guide for mankind. And this is why in the month of Ramadan, the ayah that defines the month of Ramadan that I read before you, Shah Ramadan, and the deep Muzidat in the Quran. What does Allah say immediately after that? Hudan bin Nas, the way he had him in the Quran. Immediately after that, after he says, This is the month in which Quran was revealed. Now, people might mislead, mistake this, to think this is the month where you should just get the most ajr out of Quran, and that's it. Recite the most Quran, listen to the Quran series, and you're done with this month. You got the most out of it. To protect Muslims from falling into that trap, what does Allah do immediately after? It is a guidance for mankind. So you maintain the essential purpose of this book. Revive that relationship between yourselves and this book. Now, how is the Quran a book of guidance? Now, if you look at you know, the contemporary audience, all of your contemporary audience, right? Muslims or not. You read Quran, one thing you find, almost every time it's very confusing, is that you're reading this translation and the subject doesn't seem to be completed. Like it's not like it's, there's a surah about just women and there's a surah about just the history of the sons of Israel and there's a surah just about you know, fighting in the path of Allah and there's a surah just about you know, inheritance law. It's not like that, right? It's distributed. Even the surah that's called Surah Al-Nisa, does it only deal with women? No, about 60 ayat deal with the munafiqun and then there are other people, issues with Ahmed Kitab and things like that and the Day of Judgment. So even Surah to Nisa is only on the side, right? And none of the, none of the surahs, almost, most, almost, almost all of the surahs don't deal exclusively with one subject. And that can be very troubling for a reader. You're reading Quran and you're thinking, well this is very disjointed, you know? The subject changed here, how come this was mentioned here, it's mentioned there, it's mentioned there, it's mentioned there. In what sense is it a guidance if it's like this? That is a logical question to ask in our times. And you know Muslims ask this question all the time. Non-Muslims do, of course. They, you know, uh, they accuse the Quran of being incoherent literature. I talk about that when I teach Arabic class a lot, right, and respond to that claim. But nonetheless, it is a problem that Muslims face also, especially when they're reading translation. Especially when they're reading translation. Now, how do we tackle this issue? The first thing you need to understand is that Quran's function of guidance 
the, the, the means by which it offers guidance to the people is two things, recitation and listening. That's the primary means by which the guidance is communicated. Recitation and listening. What is the formal event that makes you recite or listen to Quran? The institution that makes you recite and listen to Quran. What is it? Salah. Allah Azza wa instituted Salah, which ensures that at a few periods, a few, you know, with few gaps in the day, you will come back and seek guidance again and again and again. And just to make sure you understand this point, the Fatiha includes what words? And Fatiha is the mandatory section of every Rakam, isn't it? So we ask guidance every time we stand before Allah and the, the, the longest part of the prayer is standing, is the Qiyam. And Qiyam is entirely what? Quran. So in our Salah, we are actually asking guidance until the next prayer. And then we get to prayer, and then we're asking for guidance until the next prayer again. We better feel the sense of loss in between. Now, I didn't talk about this, I'll mention it now, it's a lame joke, but um, I like it. My teacher told it to me, so I like it. What do we want in life? What's the, what's the biggest thing you want? I mean, and he, when he gave this talk, he gave this joke, so I'll share it with you. And there's a young man, he's uh, sitting in the park, relaxing, and an old man walks by. He says, young man, what are you doing here? He says, I'm chilling, relaxing. Says, no, you shouldn't relax, you're young, you have energy, you should do work, you should do something. He said, what should I do? He said, you should sell food at least, in the park. Just set up, a, you know, set up a table here and just start selling food. He said, what should I do after that? He goes, well, if you work hard at it, you can expand your business and get two tables. He said, what should I do after that? He said, well, after that, you can get yourself a whole shack and sell food out of there. I said, then what do I do? He says, just keep working hard at it, and eventually you'll have your own food market. And then after that, well, you can buy your own farm. So you're the distributor and you're the seller. You can make lots of money. He said, what do you do after that? He goes, then you can, you're in a position to buy yourself a big house. Everything you want in that. He says, what do I do after that? He goes, then you can relax. Sit in that big house and enjoy it. He goes, no thanks, I'm already relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the concern is for human beings? To have everything they want. And you know what it is eventually that all of us want? In, you, if you don't feel it now, you'll feel it as you get a little bit older. Eventually, we want a house to our name. We want a property that is ours. We start that from childhood. If you have siblings, I want my own room. Right? Why are you sitting on my bed? That kind of stuff, right? And eventually when you go into college, I got my own apartment. Or I'm sharing, but I get my own room, right? People are proud of their space. When you get a little older, now I'm renting you know, a nice house. And eventually, I just bought this house and little party. You're really proud of yourself. Even people that work in low-paying jobs for years and years and years, at the end of it, you ask them in their retirement, you ask them, what is the accomplishment of your life? You know what they'll tell you? Well, I bought a house. Got this property to my This is the sense of stability. You know, I'm going to have what I want in it. It can be decorated the way I want, right? It's something that I don't have to worry about the future anymore. Where am I going to live? Where, where's going to be the roof over my head? It's a, it's, a, it's a matter of stability. And Allah put that in, the hu in human nature. And so, what does He offer us directions to in Quran? He offers us directions to our own property. Where is it? Send Permanent residence. No maintenance necessary, no bills to pay, and you customize the way you like it. You can stay in it as long as you want, permanently, endlessly, and here are directions to the simple guidelines that you have to follow. But for every house there's a price. For every property there's a price. When you want to buy a house in this world, I know like uh, some of my friends when I made them when I used to go to the city uh, to college, uh, they were cab drivers. And they work upwards of 70, 80, sometimes 100 hours a week. Just so they can buy a house. Just all they wanted of them. It was serious labor to get to that house, right? So Allah is offering us a path that leads us to a house. There's only one catch though. The catch is, He's offering you a property better than anything you've ever seen, ever, on TV or with your own eyes. And it is beyond anyone's imagination. The only catch is you can't see it yet. And the only other catch is it doesn't have a price tag. It doesn't have this much is what you have to pay. What he's demanding is your whole life. Give me your whole life and 
the service agreement will come to an end when you are being put, when dust is being poured over you in your grave. If you can do that, you've got the problem. If any other salesperson comes to you and offers you a deal like that, you're going to say, what? You crazy? I can't do that. I mean, give me at least a limit. How much should I give you? And then, you know, we've got some, we've, we've got a business deal. And let me see what you've got to offer. In every business transaction, when there's a promise of the future, human beings ask for at least two things. They ask for, what do I get? Or actually, rather, not what do I get, when do I get it back? When do I get my investment back, right? That's the first logical question to ask if somebody comes to you with a business proposition. The second thing to ask, can I trust you? I mean, if fine, you're saying I'll get my money back next month, but who are you? Can I really trust you? So when Quran offers this guidance, who are the only people that are actually going to dare to walk that guidance? That's the point I'm trying to make. The people who completely put their trust in Allah. People that have any doubt, any doubt whatsoever, are not going to be able to walk this path. Because you have to have absolute confidence that this promise is true. Accepting Quran as guidance. There's another scenario, however. So he says, I already know Quran. I've studied to see it. I memorized the whole thing. I read it cover to cover. I know it. I don't need guidance anymore because I already know it. Right? Just like you offer somebody directions and they say, I already got it. I know how to do it. No thanks. So you will find ourselves having this attitude of Alhamdulillah, we're already Muslim. We already know what the truth is. I don't need guidance. I already have it. I already accepted Islam. What I want to make sure you understand is that the ayah is madani and the ayah about Ramadan and about guidance is talking to Muslims and that it's telling them to seek guidance. And what I want you to understand very clearly is that the greatest sunnah is the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our messenger, who was commanded in singular, Fatiha, the surah Fatiha, the ayah that you know, uh, makes us beg for guidance, in the Nasr al is singular, in the is singular. Who is the first person to say those words in history? In Allah human beings, right? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he, till the day he dies, prays regularly, and in every prayer he asks Allah himself for guidance. Who's asking for guidance? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's asking for guidance. That is the greatest proof that being Muslim is not the same as being guided. There's a big difference between Becoming Muslim is a one-time event. And Alhamdulillah, many of us have crossed that barrier. Right? And you know, some of us, we were kind of on the corrupt side of things, and then we say, oh, Alhamdulillah, in 1994, when Allah guided me, and then <laughs> I stopped partying, right? But that's even an inappropriate term to use. Because guidance does not exist in the past tense. I mean, Allah may have guided you at that moment, but that didn't guarantee your guidance for the rest of your life. The fact that you're Muslim, that's separate, that's, separate, that's permanent. Guidance of the Qur'an is not that cheap. It's not that cheap. Any other directions in life, once you know them, you know them. Even Qur'an. If you are a scholar of Qur'an, you've got a degree in Islamic studies, you've memorized it, you've studied it, you've studied it, that still doesn't mean you've got guidance from it. You may have knowledge from it. Guidance is different. Guidance is every single day. It's every single day. And I'll just give you just a couple of examples and I'll close. Okay? You know the story of Adam alayhi salam, how many times it's mentioned in Quran? How many times it's mentioned? Very good, right? Seven times. Spread across the Quran. Right? If somebody reads the Quran, maybe one juz a day, which means it takes them a month to finish reciting, they will actually come across the story every few days. Evenly distributed. Every three, four days, they'll come across the story of Adam and Jesus. Okay, every two, three days actually. Every other day almost. Right? And it's interesting why Allah spread the, the surah or the, the mention of Adam alayhi salam across the surahs in this way. Notice something. What are the two main characters in the story? Who are the two characters being compared in the story? Adam and Shaitan, Adam and Iblis, right? Alayhi salam wa da'na wa right? Now, let's look at what these two characters have in common. They both creations of Allah. They're both honored by Allah originally. They both disobeyed Allah, true or not? They both disobeyed Allah. So far, the story is exactly the same. The story is 
the same. And then Iblis turns to Allah and asks a question. Khalaqtani, or rather makes a statement, Khalaqtani min dalim wa khalaqtani min tayin. You created me from fire, you created me from tayin. You all know this story. You know why I'm mentioning it? Think about his question. Is it logical? Fire is a greater thing than clay. Jinn can morph and change forms and fly and all of that. He certainly has tenure over Adam. So in his issue, he didn't say no. The Quran doesn't record him saying no. Quran records him making an academic, a logical statement, which is what? You made me from fire. You made him from clay. Does it make sense? That, that claim, is that rational? It is actually rational. And you know what he told Adam alayhi salam, Surah Al-A'raf, Allah, you know, when he catches Adam alayhi salam and he tells him, what led you to, to eat from that tree, right? You know what the, what the quote is? What, you, what the motivation of Adam alayhi salam was? Shaitan had come to him and told him two things. Either you will become angels or you will become permanent dwellers. That's really important to understand. You know why he mentioned permanent dwellers? When Adam was introduced to mankind, to, 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 to angels rather, what did Allah say? إِنِّي جَعِلُمْ إِنْ أَرْضِ خَلِفًا I'm appointing on the earth, on the earth, someone who will continue in lineage. Khalifa is taken in different words, different interpretations, but well, let's just take one. But the angels knew that the purpose of Adam is in Jannah or on the earth? On the earth. That's what the ayah says. And when Iblis goes to him, he says, you want to stay here forever? Just eat from that tree, because you know the plan is to take you to earth. That's what the plan is. And angels can stay here, or if you want to stay forever, let me eat from that tree. So when Adam is caught, right? Shaban was caught, Iblis was caught, he gave an intellectual response, right? When Adam is caught, he could have very well have said, look, this is all predestination. You already knew I was going to get sent to the earth. That was the plan from the beginning. If you knew it, then it's not my fault. Don't just fall in book. I'm just a trap in your plan. Right? Is, is that an intellectual response, yes or no? Can that be philosophically argued? Sure. But what's the response of Allah? He accepts his guilt, and he makes Allah to Allah when Allah teaches him the words. He accepts it humbly. For someone who wants guidance, you have been given two possibilities. You can try to become intellectual, and question the will of Allah. And feel really smart about it too. Feel very smart about it. Oh man, I came up with this philosophical question, nobody's got the answer to it. If I do something, and Allah already knew I was going to do it, <laughs> then it ain't my fault. Right? You've got two options. Allah has placed two options before all of us and we get reminded of them every day. Every day you will have to make decisions, and you will make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, you will have the option of going the Shaitan route, and rationalizing your mistake, or you have the option of going the, the route of our father who made tawbah and was forgiven by Allah. You have the option. You get, you get mentioned every time, every time, every time. And the stories in the Quran aren't stories. They're such profound lessons. They're such incredible lessons. You know, when you think of a movie or any other story, you think of hero and villain, right? And then like extra characters. When you think of Yusuf A.S. story, who's the hero? Who's the main character? Who's, who's like the guy you're looking to, to, to hear good news about? Yusuf A.S. Who are the villains? His brothers. That's only in story life. In real life, things are more complicated, aren't, aren't they? You can't just label someone as a hero and a villain. People are human beings, they do bad things sometimes, they, they do good things other times. The question is, if the, the other brothers of Yusuf A.S. are all evil, why are they evil? Were they brought up in a bad environment? Who's their father? Yaqub A.S. Who's his father? Yep, Ishaq A.S. Who's his father? Ibrahim A.S. So if you're going to talk about proper upbringing, you can't find a better bunch. Whose dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather are all prophets, not to mention their brother, right? Best possible upbringing. Isn't that true? So you can't say these people loved it, you know, lived in a rough uh, neighborhood and they didn't learn their ethics properly, that's why they did what they did. You can't say that. You can't just say black and white, they're villains. I mean, you're speaking about children of a problem. Direct children of a problem. 
What made them? What made them go to that extent? What is mentioned in this story is something very real to human beings. Good people, out of jealousy, can do some crazy things sometimes. And did they think Allah at the end did they regret what they did at the end? Sure. Because they're not permanently labeled as villains. And they must be defeated. This is real life. This is not a story. So the lessons in the in, in Quran, these stories that we basically romanticized and turned them into, you know, just here's the story, here are the characters, this is what happened at the end. They all have, every word has such guidance in it for us, for our daily affairs, for our day-to-day -day lives, and we tend to ignore them. Quran can be studied, and we have to fulfill our obligations to Quran, a number of things we have to do for Quran. Now, here's where I'm going to leave you with a list of things to do or to worry about this month, inshallah, and I'll close. The first thing, you have to fix your attitude towards the Quran. Really under saying, you know, Imam bi kitabillah, belief in the book of Allah. The first thing that has to change is our attitude. What does this book mean to me? Why do I need to study it? Does it offer me any guidance? Am I actually lost? Do I actually believe in this book or do I believe in this book? You know the difference in semantics? Believing the book and believing in the book? All of us, alhamdulillah, believe in the book. But when it comes to believing the book, it's saying something is true, your intellect doesn't agree, do you still believe it? How many people have the attitude of Adam That's the question to be asked. Our attitude towards this book has to be fixed. The second thing that has to be fixed is our etiquette towards this book, our manners towards this book. The time we give it, the way in which we recite it. You know, you feel embarrassment if you have the funny accent and you're speaking and everybody look at you and like, you know, you feel embarrassment, you try to fix your accent. And yet we recite Quran with our hideous knowledge of the And it's just, it's such disrespect to Quran, yet we don't feel concerned that we should learn proper etiquette to recite the word of Allah. After all, these are words that came out from the mouth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From my beloved, from your beloved, they came out of his mouth. They were given to him by Allah himself. You're, you're quoting the Messenger of Allah. Do you ever think about that? Quran is not just recitation. It is a quotation of the Messenger of Allah. He said, quote, this, and Allah told him to say so. The revelation directly from Allah. You're quoting. So our mannerism, the concern to learn to read proper recitation, time to memorize more and more of it, etc. has to change. The etiquette towards Quran, especially in Salah, and the prayer has to change. And make this a lot of opportunity to do so. When you stand before Allah and you recite Fatiha, I know you recited it a thousand times, but recite it like Allah is right in front of you and you're on the Day of Judgment. Recite it like you really mean it. This word of Allah, this is not just any other words. It's not just something you memorized. That's what it was when we were kids. Now we should know better. It shouldn't be the same, right? So our mannerisms have to change. The third thing that has to change is our concern to understand it. You can't understand, you can't take guidance if you don't understand the direction. Right? If you don't speak, you know, Italian and I give you directions in Italian, it doesn't mean anything to you, right? So this book, a lot is lost in translation. A lot, a lot is lost in translation. And all of us should feel the thirst to want to fill that void between ourselves and Quran, and gap of translation. You know, we should try to learn the Arabic language to the best of our ability. Of course, you may not be able to do that during Ramadan, but at least try to fulfill the other obligations. And until you do learn Arabic, at least pick up a good book of tafsir and study. Understand at least what you memorize and what you use in salah. What you use in the prayer. Constant. Look at the fruits of those ayat, the benefits of those ayat in your personal life. This is how, you know, the Sahaba, they looked at Quran. They looked at Quran as a manual for life. Whenever they heard an ayah, they applied it right away. Guidance, that's what you do, right? Take a left, you take a left. That's what they used to do. Quran for us is more about ceremony. Good recitation, you're, you pop in a CD and you've got a long ride. You don't get edge of for it, but it's ceremonial almost, right? And there's a big, like, nikah, and we'll open with a recitation of, you know, the Quran. By the way, you know when the nikah happens? What did the Prophet also used to recite? What ayah? Ittaqu Allah, ya ayyuhal nas. Ittaqu Rabbahum. Alladhi khalaqakum in nafsi wahida. Right? Be conscious of your Lord, the one who created you from a single cell. Why is that ayah recited at the time of nikah, at the time of marriage? You know why? Because between the husband and the wife, the husband is being told, you are not being put in the situation or in the relationship where you're the owner, you're the Lord. Who's the Lord? Allah is the Lord. 
fear him and take care of your relationship. He created you. He's putting you in this place. Guidance is being offered at that ceremony. By the, the choice of the, 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 the ayah choice is by the Rasulullah himself. It's the established sunnah of the khutbah of nikah. Right? So we really, really have to become people that try and seek guidance every time from Allah's book. See, really try to find direction from Allah's book. You know, one of the practices I try, I don't guarantee it, but really I recommend trying it. If you ever feel like you need direction, you should all the time. Open up the book of Allah and start reciting and Allah you will find guidance. You will find what you need. You will find an answer to what you need. And subhanAllah, subhanAllah, none of the stories are buried in history. None of the ayat of Quran are irrelevant today. All of it offers this guidance today. Even Alif Lam Mim. Who knows what Alif Lam Mim means? Who knows what it means? Allah knows best, right? Alif Lam Mim, Kaf Haya, Ain Sal, you don't know what it means? But how does the first major surah of Quran, Fatiha is the introduction, the biggest surah of Quran is Baqarah. And it begins, Alif Lam Mim. Now if I'm saying every ayah of Quran is guidance, how is Alif Lam Mim guidance too? Again, a logical question, right? Trying to be intellectual. Tell me where the guidance is in the family. Well, here's the guidance. Allah introduces you to the book and gives you words whose meanings only He knows. So He's correcting your attitude. You know nothing. I know everything. And if you come to the book with this attitude, then you will find guidance. So He begins by humbling us. I don't need. And then He gives us His lesson. If you don't have that attitude, you're not going to find much in Allah's book. I really pray that we are able to take advantage of this one to the, to the utmost, to revive our relationship with Allah's book, to maintain, you know, try to get it in a routine, and try to get it in a routine before Ramadan, so you don't lose any Ramadan days. Get up early, before you go to work or school, figure out an hour or so where you can just learn, study, memorize, do something with Quran. Just give your morning some of that chunk of your time. Every single day. Starting now, so you're in the routine by the time Ramadan comes. Don't say I'm going to start when Ramadan comes, because getting in a routine takes a few days. Right? So you'll lose a couple of Ramadan days, just getting into the routine. And do something you've never done before for Allah in Ramadan. Do something that will, that just really shows Allah your commitment to this book. That you really want to get the most out of this book. I'm also extending, uh, using this opportunity, invitation to all of you. Inshallah Ta'ala, I've made the commitment uh, at Masjid Al-Qur'an in Bayshore to conduct uh, the rules of Qur'an every night after the Taraweeh prayer. Inshallah, I'll be going through the entire Qur'an, Fatiha Tanas, Ayah by Ayah, in brief translation and explanation when necessary. But through the entire Qur'an. So for many of you who haven't read the Qur'an in entirety, who would want to know what its meanings are, who are confused by some ayat, you know, they don't, know, they don't understand the context and how it places in the passage, Things like, issues like that I'll try to explain uh, in that series, inshallah, we'll go through one juz of Qur'an every single night. It will end around midnight every night. It will be a long endeavor. But inshallah, if you have the time, I would recommend if you don't know Arabic, if you'd like to get introduced to Allah's book, it's not a very academic study. The purpose of it again is to introduce a casual introduction to, uh, uh, for Muslims and not to Allah's book in a way that makes them appreciate Qur'an as guidance. That's my intention. Just look at Qur'an as guidance. I won't go into like deep linguistic issues and the historical context. When necessary, I will, but I'm not, I don't want to make it an academic series at all. This is a series just for us to get a little bit closer to Allah's book and appreciate this guidance. I pray that anything good that came out of my mouth is uh, rewarded by Allah's wisdom. And I pray that all of us uh, have an attitude of sincerity for every second that we spend for His cause. I pray that Allah's wisdom accepts this gathering and all of the gatherings of Muslims. And I, I pray that Allah's wisdom protect and uh, continue to protect the honor of the Muslims. Barakallahu wa alaykum wa sallam wa alaykum. Okay, so uh, we have the Q&A right now. There should be an awareness like this is over there. Uh, I'm going to see if we can get it. Uh, anyone have any questions? Oh wait, I'm sure it's somebody. We have like 200 people in. There we go. Hold on. Questioning in, uh, yeah, what is it okay to question? Few tips on that. Uh, the first thing, don't question around people that know the same amount as you. Okay, like if you know that the guy that you're talking to basically has the same level of knowledge, then questioning will actually put that doubt in his or her mind, right? You should 
make it a habit to ask people that you know are scholars or know the subject well and pose questions to them. And also, one should be careful in the manner in which they pose questions. We already believe it's a lost word, right? So we shouldn't pose questions like, what's the point of saying this? Because that would be sort of blasphemous. But to develop a more respectful attitude towards the, the way questions are framed. Like, what is the wisdom of Allah that you understand behind this? Right? So questioning is fine, so long as it's within respectful terms. And it's done in the appropriate setting. Like, if I'm just sitting in a, you know, a club with some guys, I'm like, no, oh, Quran says this, and those guys don't know anyone, like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, then that's a major problem. That's a serious problem. But we have to show better etiquette towards Allah. So these are the two major tips on that. Unless you have a scholar of Hadith, you can do something. If you don't have any other questions, I just want to make a quick comment. One last thing about Hadith. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, I, 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 
the question I have, uh, this is something I really didn't want to bring in here, these people will take other way, but this is a valid question, I need to know the answer, uh, if you may uh, help out on this. Uh, I have read uh, some information about, uh, recently, uh, there, there were some information given on one the website about the moon side, but this is not a moon side question, but I'm going to the real question on that, don't take it in the network. Uh, the, one of the I am the Quran and say about uh, uh, about the witness in the moon, uh, uh, seeing the moon. It says the word is uh, shah sh shahida. Uh, let's uh, see. They interpreted it in four different ways, saying that the word shahida it could be it could mean to see, and then say it could be to know, then say it could be. Uh, to understand so forth, uh, because this this is because in the, in the context of uh, seeing the moon, and also the Hadith from Rasulullah from say, do not fast until you see the moon. Now, is it is it okay to understand that the word shahida directly applies to see either the Hadith, uh, or it can be otherwise meaning those additional meanings are given. So this, I don't have knowledge, but it's just a question in my mind. Who to ask? All right. Uh, you have to, I can recommend some literature on this issue. But um, first things first. Linguistic analysis is not necessarily Quran, uh, Quranic analysis. There are uh, criteria in the school of Sea that you have to go through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And linguistic analysis, which is what is being offered, may contradict what comes before it in priority. And if it does, it's rejected. Okay. Uh, one of the things that contradicts it is the established practice of the companions of the messenger, so, so, for example, is Ma'as Sahaba. Right? Now, Shahida, linguistically, does have the meaning of witnessing, testifying, attesting to something, certifying something, seeing something. It has those implications. But, and I'm not coming to the see of the eye in particular, sorry. Um, but, before we can make a conclusion about it, just using linguistics as a reference, one has to go through the entire cycle of Sul Tafsir and then make a conclusion. Those, those, that chain cannot be ignored. Meaning, where does it start? Quran, interpreting Quran, then the Sunnah, then the Sahaba, then the established uh, Ijma of the scholars after them, and then linguistic analysis. Right? And so then you reach a conclusion. That's how Sul Tafsir works. So we can't ignore those principles and say, well, the word can be taken this way or that way or the other way. Because that can lead to huge problems in Quran. For example, الَّذِينَ يَغُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَامُ رَبِّهِمْ The proper close rendition in English would be those who have certainty, who are absolutely certain that they are going to meet their Lord. But that has another meaning. You know what that is? To kind of be suspicious about something. So the translation would then be, those who are a little bit suspicious that they're going to meet their Lord. <laughs> So if you're just taking linguistic analysis, what happens? You can really take major problems, right? So, you know, the, the Arabic is, is kind of cool in that way that one word can have like 80 different meanings, but the one or the, the, the spectrum is limited by a of tafsir. That it's not the entire spectrum of meanings, but the spectrum is limited to a few, or maybe just one by a of tafsir. So this is where I, I think that's the most logical response. Uh, if you have if you're fluent in uh, English, then I guess you could read um, Ma'arif al-Qur'an has his uh, PDF, I think, online somewhere. His, the Muhammad Shafi's English uh, tafsir, or Urdu tafsir, translated into English, or if you have the Urdu copy, you can get that. Otherwise, I would recommend some Arabic stuff for it. Sorry. Yeah. Do you all actually even have first on Hamdi country? Yeah. Yeah, you know in Ramadan, the like, devils are chained up. Yeah. <coughs> So in Ramadan, uh, devils are chained up, right? So does Congress pass any bills? No, I just have a question in relation to that, right? Uh, so the devils are chained up, basically that means that they're not acting as much in terms of uh, you know, praying and all these kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what about the sins that we still continue in Ramadan, right? Yeah. So the devils are not there as to affect it as much, right? right? But we still continue the sins. And, like people still don't pray in Ramadan, right? Yes. And that's the sin throughout the whole year. But they still continue this. Or for example, people don't fast. But what do you recommend in terms of these kind of weaknesses? What are they do to and like what can we do about those sins that still don't go away in Ramadan? Okay. Uh, two things. 
uh, I'll tell you a true story. A really good friend of mine in North Carolina uh, is doing his PhD in history, the history of science. He's writing a paper on Islamic science. Uh, he had a coworker who he used to talk to about Islam. Every time the word Islam came out of his mouth, three key words, Islam, Muhammad, Quran. Any of these words, if they came out of his mouth, and a lie, it was a lie. Any of these words ever came out of his mouth, you know what happened to that person? He would start wheezing, red eyes, allergic reactions, almost feel like vomiting, he'd get very angry and upset, all this kind of stuff, right? So he just stopped talking about Islam ever. He didn't, he's not giving like preaching now, he's just bring it up casually, and this guy would have this reaction. And he tried it in Ramadan and nothing. And he talked to him directly about Islam, nothing. The day Ramadan ended, he talked to him again and the same thing again. The Shunaqli are an entity. They are, you know, we believe in that already, but it is part of, you know, experience of the Muslims, right? That this entity exists. But the people that are addicted to sins, and they're addicted to missing their obligations in me. The change doesn't come from behavior, necessarily. The first change is a change, it's a sort of a cognitive change, a change in the way they think. If you know someone like that, right, and they're the same in Ramadan as they are outside of Ramadan, right, the best thing you can do for them in Ramadan is give them an opportunity to hear a reminder, an effective reminder. Okay, maybe by some enticing or taking them to, you know, for free pizza or something, grab them to a really good khutbah or lecture or something, right, or pop a tape in when you're driving with them. Because at that point, the shayateen will not turn them off. The shayateen usually, what they do is they cause distraction. Well, I'm the whole was the, even the tactical of the mushrikun. Whenever Quran is being read, then start talking about something else. Or we cause a distraction, right? But in Ramadan, these, if they're Muslims, they have a soft corner because it's already Ramadan, plus the extra help is not there, the volunteer shayateen are not there. So they'll have, they'll be in a better position to actually maybe get effect from some of that reminder. The thing you don't want to change is behavior. The thing you want to try and change are the hearts, right? And Allah changes the hearts. But He changes them by means of reminder. Right? So what you want to do for people like that, you want to put them in a position of remembrance. Maybe it's like I really recommend like the Awla Ki Ashara series. I take one of those on top of me or something, right? Or, um, you know, take them where usually a lot of Ashra Tamil have, I don't want to say, but really boring kopas. Right, for Jamar. So try to take them somewhere a little more exciting, where they get a little fired up, right? Uh, or take them to a masjid where there's really good talking or really beautiful recitation, something like that. But you shouldn't necessarily enforce them to change their behavior, because behavior will change once there's a change in the heart. You don't have to worry about the behavior. You have to worry about fixing their attitude all the time. Ourselves. Oh, you know, the best thing I can tell you, there, there are different levels of people. Uh, there are people that can make a commitment and stick to it and for themselves. And then there are people that become weak in their commitments. The people that become weaker in their commitments and they fall into temptation and things like that, the best advice for them is to be in the company constantly, as much as they possibly can. They have to, you know, if they're usually at home, just go home, just go to Russia. Just go somewhere where it's least likely for you to sin. Right? If you have to do your homework assignment on your laptop, you could do it sitting in your dorm room or you could go in the lecture and do it in the right? Which is safer, obviously. Right? So just take the safer option and be, you know, right? be among the righteous, be with the righteous, okay? be with the truthful. So that company will, will strengthen you. And besides the other thing I can recommend is, uh, doing things that involve a lot of effort for the path of Allah. Like, you know, there's a really far away class that you got to drive all the way to and go and attend or something. Something that's going to involve strenuous effort, takes time and effort, it then in itself is a verifying experience. So, yeah.
Okay. We, but th then there was the ayah of Ibrahim السلام, who used to ask for guidance of his father. But after his father died, he used to still ask for forgiveness of his father. Then the ayah came down telling him to stop. Right? The, the Quran records this incident, right? Why? Because you can't ask for salvation of people who died on the false belief. But if they haven't yet died, then you ask that Allah guide all people. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. No? That's what you want to do. If they're genuinely asked, they'll call the guard. Inshallah. I'm sorry. Why is the why is that the testimony of one person sufficient for the beginning of the Why do you mean quite two for the beginning Is it because we're too hasty to jump into it? I don't know. I, I'll tell you something about my personal Islamic studies. I don't concern myself with the things that don't directly apply to me. And I trust scholars. And certain scholars I trust, and if they give a rationale in their position, enough for me. I don't do like in-depth research in things that I don't think affect my life forever. So I don't see it. Yeah. Then if you get to that point, if you get to that point, it's incumbent upon you to study. Seriously study. So that you can, you are not yet in a position to weigh one argument over the other because you're not qualified to do so, right? You're like in third grade math and two guys are debating over a calculus formula and it's irrelevant to you, right? But, so if you find yourself in that state of confusion, it becomes incumbent on every Muslim who's in that state of confusion to actually study the subject. But until then, you should trust at least case law. Because we don't have a choice in that matter. If you say I don't study any, I don't trust any scholar, you're crazy. Because that's all we have of Islam. We have the legacy of the scholars. Even the people, the most hardcore, like I don't follow any scholars, they'll also be a scholar. What's that? What's that? I don't listen to him. I was like, I thought you don't listen to him. Well, he doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. Where did the Kullah go, right? The same way with all the other things that we're forbidden from. We're not just 
stay away from them so we can just keep looking at them and say, ah, I fall me. No, no, no. We're away from them so we can worry about other things. So we can strengthen other parts of our intellect. Right? The, the moral element, dimension of our intellect. That's what we have to do. So don't miss the point of the fast, please. Do not miss the point of the fast. And let me, you know, one thing that I want to share with you that most people don't know, the word salah is still musalman. The, the word for fasting in Arabic, you know what it was used for originally? It was used for training battle horses. They used to make the horse not drink a lot for a long, for a long time because on the battlefield, among the Arabs, if you take the camel, it's kind of slow, so you need to take the horse. But if you take the horse, he dehydrates too fast. So he dies, basically, which means you die. So they used to train their horses for battle, and they used to make them do what is called salm in Arabic. And that's the term used in Quran for fasting. You know what that teaches us? That teaches us that fasting was a means of training for a larger purpose. Linguistically speaking, it is training for a greater cause. It's not the cause in and of itself, right? The greater cause is not Allah, Allah. But to get there, you have to have fasting. There are only a few things in Quran that lead to taqwa. There are only only handful of them. Fasting is one of them. Fasting is one of the things that can lead you to become conscious of Allah. Don't lose that opportunity and just obsess over things that you made so much effort to get away from. Right? So you can you can concern yourself with other things. I hope that inshallah that suffices for a response. You have a comment? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if people who believe that all you need is the Quran and they can um, interpret yourself and don't need the Sunan Hadith, uh, how to speak to them in a proper manner? You second grade, you start with that. And then you say to them, what is wrong with you? <laughs> then you say, fine, let's say you're right. You ask them, is the Quran full of contradictions? What will they say? No. That's why we believe in it. And you say, okay, in one place Allah says, you know, um, Between you and him is animosity, treat him as though he's your intimate friend. Is this an ayah of tolerance or intolerance? What I just read before. If, he, if there's animosity between both of you, then you treat him like your intimate friend. Tolerance or intolerance? Tolerance. Oh. You go to Baqarah and you find Qadiyuhu. وَقُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ فَقِفْتُوهُمْ Kill them wherever you find them. Tolerance or intolerance? Intolerance. Contradiction? One place you're saying treat them like your best friend, the other place Allah is saying kill them wherever you find them. Which one is it? You can't be the best friend on the battlefield and then kill them. What does it mean? Yeah, so then how do you resolve it? The only way to resolve the contradictions, apparent contradictions in the Quran, are historical context. Where is historical context? Does the Quran give historical context? No. Nope. It's all in the seal. And if they tell you no, that's obvious because this is Meccan Quran and that is Madani Quran. They will say that, right? This is a Meccan Surah, that's Madani Surah, that's why there's no contradiction. They say, how did you know it's Meccan or Madani? Where did you get that from? Is there an ayah that says this is a Meccan ayah? No. That's in the seal actually. Then there's another problem, another symbol. These are just second grade arguments from people who deny hadith. Second grade arguments. You don't need more than that. They say hadith can't be trusted because it was transmitted. Hadith can be trusted because it was transmitted by men and I don't trust men. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But, uh, so you say, okay, fine, you don't trust hadith. Great. Did Allah protect the Qur'an? They say, no, Allah guaranteed He will protect the Qur'an and He didn't guarantee that He will protect Hadith. That's the tagline they use all the time. Right? You say, okay, fine. How did Allah protect the Qur'an? Did He send a, you know, a, a, a safe from the sky, you put the Qur'an in it, you close it, you can never touch it. How did He protect it? What was the means? There's, there's always a means, right? Like Allah destroyed, you know, the, the, the nation of Nuh by means of a flood. Right? There's a means. Or Allah helped the sons of Islam by means of parting the water? How do you protect? How did Allah protect the Quran? Yeah, for Allah. People who memorized the Quran and transmitted it. Who memorized the Quran? The Sahaba. Who's transmitting the Hadith? Okay. I trust them for Quran, I don't trust them for Hadith. If they can't be trusted for one, then they can't be trusted for the other. Right? You can't say, oh, Allah is somehow magically making you say the right thing when you recite Quran. When it comes to hadith, you know, Allah kind of removes that protection and then you say whatever you want. It's the same person. It's the same people. If you take one out, the whole thing is done. 
And that's the actual intent of these people. The intent isn't to deny sunnah. The intent is like to take out the entire deen. مُذَبْذَبِينَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ You know, this is mentioned. These people are particularly mentioned. Find the ayah of Surah Al-Nisa. I'll give you a clue. Find the ayah of Surah Al-Nisa. And talk about the people that deny hadith. There's an ayah directly talking about these people. يُفَرِّقُونَ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرُسُلِ They cause distinction between Allah and His Messengers. And they want to find a path in between the two. What is it between Allah and the Messenger? Nothing. So they want to find, because there's a unit, right? So if you're going between the two, then you're neither on Allah, you're not neither on Allah, nor the Messengers. So you feel like you basically got away with following anything. Without following anything. So these are, you know, simple arguments, but then there are even more academic type responses, but these are usually enough for people. The contradictions can't be resolved, Maki Madani can't be resolved, the uh, uh, preservation of Quran cannot be defended if you deny Hadith. Can you define what ayah that was? What ayah was? The contradiction one? No, I'm not going to tell you the ayah, just look it up. So it's in the side. It's a great read. It's 176 ayahs. But I'll tell you it's about 70. It'll make it easier. And my hope one is to encourage you to recite Quran. Is that the problem?